Hello, David Deager Hernandez here, and welcome to Spirit Church. Today, I'm going to be talking about the healing ministry, and I'm going to be giving you keys on how to walk in God's healing power. The truth is, God wants to use your hands to heal the sick. If you have Christ in your heart, then the healing power of Christ rests on your life. And God wants to use you to see miracles, to see healing, and to set people free from their disease, to set people free from the bondage of sickness. And God wants to use your life in a supernatural way. We're gonna be looking to the healing ministry of Jesus. This message is going to be entitled, How Jesus Healed the Sick. And we're gonna be looking at the healing ministry of Jesus, what did Jesus do? How did he heal the sick? What were the contributing factors to the power that rested on his life when healing the sick? We're going to get into all that and more today here on this edition of Spirit Church. But first, it's time for worship. Stephen Moctezuma is here with us again. In the splendor of a king Clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. And he wraps himself in light. And darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. And how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and oh we'll see how great how great is our God we sing how great is our God how great is our God Sing with me how great is our God, and oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. We sing the name above all names, He's a name above all names. Worthy of all praise And my heart will sing How great is our God Name above all names He's a name above all names Worthy of all praise And my heart will sing How great is our God We sing again, how great is our God How great is our God Sing with me how great is our God and oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. So today we're going to look at the healing ministry of Jesus. And I'm excited to teach this to you because these are keys that I've picked up along the line after being in the healing ministry. I've been in the healing ministry since I was 13 years old, 26 now. So it's been almost... 13 years going on 14 years now and more than that I think it's important not just to look at man or to look at um, people who've gone before us and I do obviously honor people like Oral Roberts, Catherine Coleman, A.A. A. Allen though many of them had their flaws they still were instruments used by God uh, for the healing power to flow through their lives and touch people and often you may look at sick people you may look at those who are in need and say, Lord, use my life in that same way. I want to be used as a vessel of healing that when I touch them, when I pray for them, that heaven responds to the request as I lay hands on them. And really, it is a grace. The healing ministry is not something that is man-made. The healing ministry cannot be cultivated by my own free will. It's something that I have to connect with God for, and God has to endow you with the healing touch on your life. 
Um, there's the gift of healing. There's the great commission that comes with healing. And then there's also that special grace of healing that God puts on some believers. And it's obvious because certain believers seem to have um, more of a, if I may call it this, more of a success rate when it comes to the healing power of God. And though, again, I did hesitate to call it that because we're not necessarily supposed to be results driven, but more obedience driven. It is important that we acknowledge that there are special graces and special gifting for certain things. But I think that it's important to look to the greatest healing evangelist of all time. And the greatest healing evangelist of all time was Jesus Christ. He walked out the perfect healing ministry. He neither went to the extremes of the bazaar, nor did he go to the extremes of religion. He didn't go to put on a show. He didn't go to make a name for himself. Jesus had the perfect perspective. Jesus had the perfect power. And Jesus had the perfect presentation of the healing ministry in the earth as it should have been. And really, he is the ultimate standard. You see, if we keep measuring, though we honor men and women who've gone before us, if we keep measuring the healing ministry by other ministries, not only do we pick up on the good that come with them, but we also can pick up on some of the negative things. I know in my life, a certain um, things that I would say are not necessarily the best were imparted through other healing ministries. And when I look to that, I say, okay, Lord, you got to do away with the flaws. you got to do away with what was imparted because we receive everything when we are imparted to from someone else. So it's important that though we do look to men sometimes for inspiration or leadership, Paul the Apostle wrote, follow me as I follow Christ. It's important that when doing so, we filter everything through Christ Jesus so that you know that you're looking to the ultimate standard, which is Christ himself and not man. So the ultimate standard is Christ. And there are some dangers that come when you look to man as the ultimate example, uh, namely that as you go down generation to generation, if it's man copying, man copying, man copying, man, I mean, you know this, if you get a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, eventually those copies begin to lose details and start to take on imperfections that blur the image and cause it to become skewed somewhat. And the longer you do that, the more often you do that, the more skewed the image becomes. But when you have the original and you make copies of the original, the copies that are made are crisp, they're clean. They're with fewer flaws, though a copy is always going to have some flaws. It's as if Christ is the marvelous light and we are just mirrors. And if we reflect off other mirrors that are reflecting that light, we start to lose the brightness. And also there are some smudges on a mirror. There are some cracks on some mirrors. And we start to lose that image. It becomes skewed. So we have to look to the image of Jesus. We have to look at him and say, how did he do it? How did he respond to people? How did he view the healing power of God? What was his lifestyle like? You know, if you want the healing power of Christ, you have to have the lifestyle of Christ. To heal like Jesus, you have to walk like Jesus. To, to move in that kind of power, you have to obey God like Jesus obeyed God. So the benefits of Christ's likeness are that you become an, a reflection of the perfect image rather than a reflection of a man or a woman generations past. Though again, I do want to reiterate, it's important that we receive impartation from spiritual generals or from people who have that grace on their life. That's how impartation comes. In fact, Paul wrote to Timothy that Timothy received the gifts through the laying on of his hands, though the gift ultimately came from Christ. So number one, it's important that we look to Jesus, the greatest healing evangelist of all time. So I'm going to look at some keys now to Jesus's healing ministry, some facts about Jesus that when you note them, reflect them, and act in them, you'll begin to see the power of God demonstrated in your life in greater measures. I'm talking about greater miracles, and yes, there are greater miracles, the greatest of all being salvation. I mean, it's easy to say that someone being healed of cancer is greater than someone being healed of a headache. Someone being healed of AIDS is greater than someone being healed of a broken bone. So there are healings, and then there are miracle healings. I mean, when you think about the body's amazing ability to heal itself over time, really, all of us heal. But it is the rapid healing or the lack of time that lapses and a healing happens instantly that causes it to become a miracle. I mean, healing itself is uh, a gift from God that he's put in our bodies for, obviously, practical reasons. But when you look at the healing ministry of Jesus, you start to see greater miracles. I mean... 
uh, just the, the success rate that Jesus healed the sick, it's marvelous that they would line up by hundreds and he would heal one after another, after another, after another. And I would even tell you, if you come to one of my healing services, you know, some will be healed, but you won't see anywhere near as healed as many as Jesus healed. I mean, the scripture says over and over and over again that as many as touched him were made whole, that he healed all, he healed all, he healed all. You see that mentioned many times in scripture and everything within my heart burns to say, Lord, the more I reflect Christ, the greater the healing anointing will increase. So I want to become more like Jesus. So the way you live your life actually affects the gift of healing. The way you live your life affects your ability to move in the healing power of God. And you want to see those greater miracles. You can see them. You want to see people get out of wheelchairs, drop crutches, take off casts, remove neck braces, have doctor's reports in their hands. Then you have to walk like Jesus walked. Don't look to me. Look to Jesus. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So the keys to Jesus' healing ministry. Number one, this may be a challenge for some, but this is the truth. Number one, Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. The scripture says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, that though he was God, he did not allow himself to take on the benefits of being divine, that he stripped himself of his godly nature and became a man to serve. So Christ Jesus was God in identity, but man in nature. Often we look at Jesus and the sinless life that he lived. I mean, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, I, I believe it says, where Jesus goes, Be ye perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Job chapter 1, verse 1 says, There was a man who dwelt in the land of us, his name was Job, and he was perfect and upright before the Lord. I believe it's 2 Timothy 3 that talks about the perfecting of the saints. So there's this wholeness, there's this maturity that you can come to where you have victory over sin, and people will look at that and say, well, Jesus was able to resist sin because he was God. But remember, Jesus stripped himself of the nature of the divine and became a human being. He was fully human in nature and fully God in identity. Everything that Jesus did was because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' ability to heal, Jesus' ability to cast out devils, Jesus' ability to to hear God and know people's thoughts was all in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we are without excuse when we say, well, I can't heal like Jesus healed because he was Jesus or he was God. No, no, he was God in identity, but man in nature. And he relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. I love the way the scripture puts this. Acts chapter 10, verse number 38. The scripture says this. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Now look at the way it words it. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So first, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And second, Jesus was anointed with power. And then he went out healing the sick casting out devils and doing the work of God in the earth. So Jesus had to be first filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, in fact, I, I have a note here that Jesus trusted the Holy Spirit for his resurrection. I want you to think about this. This is, this is so powerful when you understand what Christ truly did. Jesus was the Son and the Father and the Spirit. And they were all one. Never before had they been separated. Never before had they known a breaking of that union. The Trinity was perfect throughout all of eternity. Not once had their union ever been disrupted. So, when Jesus went to the cross, and the scripture says that he looked up and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from the Father. For the first time in all of eternity, if it could even be worded that way, Jesus was separated from God and he trusted the Holy Spirit. So imagine this. Here's Jesus who's subjecting himself to death, subjecting himself to being a human, stripping off the divine nature, being forsaken of the Father. All he had to rely upon was the Holy Spirit. 
all he had to rely upon was the power of the Spirit to raise him from the dead. In fact, let's go here to, I want to show you this. Uh, he was abandoned in Mark 15, 34. That's where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, the scripture says that the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. But we read that in passing, not realizing that it's saying the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. Who raised Jesus from the dead? It was the Holy Spirit. In fact, the scripture also says, and I won't turn there for time's sake, but you can read in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, that Jesus prayed to the one who could save his soul from death, who could raise him from the dead. Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit. Now, if Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit, how much more should we? If Jesus trusted the Holy Spirit, how much more should we? If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do we? Number one, Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Often we resist the Holy Spirit, citing many bizarre actions that Christians have taken in the name of the Holy Spirit. And we do away with His gifts. We do away with His power because we don't want to get too odd or we're afraid or we have reservations mentally and emotionally. But Jesus threw himself on the Spirit. Number two, Jesus had a prayer life. Now, I like to say that prayer is as powerful as God. Prayer can do everything that God can. Prayer is the will of God in action in the earth. Prayer is God intervening. Prayer is God transforming you. Prayer is like a portal through which God can come and move. Jesus had a prayer life. Now, the scripture says in John chapter 5, verse 19, this is a powerful verse. This gives us insight into the prayer life of Jesus. John chapter 5, verse 19, it says this. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by Himself. He does only what He sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Jesus obeyed the Father, directed in prayer. So Jesus' prayer life allowed Him to receive instruction from His Father, and He carried out that instruction through obedience in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had a prayer life. Now, the scripture also says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, that Jesus went off to pray alone. And then in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 6, Jesus tells us, don't babble like the pagans do. Don't, don't go and pray like the Pharisees because they want to be seen. He says, when you pray, instead, go by yourself. Lock yourself in the room. Pray privately to your father. And your father who sees you praying privately will reward you openly. Jesus had a prayer life. He had a prayer life in private, and he instructed us to also have that prayer life in private. Jesus was also uh, very disciplined. He would pray in the morning, according to Mark chapter 1, verse 35. He would pray at night, according to Mark chapter 6, verse 46 to 47. In fact, the scripture even says that Jesus withdrew often in Luke chapter 5, verse 16. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Mark chapter 6, verse 46 to 47, and Luke chapter 5, verse 16, in each one of those scriptures, it says that he withdrew. He found a private place. He went to a quiet place. He secluded himself. He found the silence and stillness and seclusion and the power in the privacy of prayer. Jesus had a prayer life. If you want to heal like Jesus healed, you need to pray like Jesus prayed. We can't expect the power to be on our lives if we're not spending time in prayer. I can say this again and again and again, and still there will be those who in their minds look at themselves as the exception. You know you look at yourself as the exception because you attempt to do ministry without a prayer life. Now, how is God supposed to anoint and empower your ministry if you're not in prayer? How is God supposed to empower you if you're not surrendering in prayer? God cannot use you to the most potential that you have. God cannot use you to your capacity if you're not praying. 
Jesus prayed often. Jesus prayed at night. In fact, I love this verse too. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12 through 13, the scripture says that Jesus prayed all night. Why? Because the next morning he was going to select his disciples. Jesus would go and pray for extended times of prayer when making major decisions. Do you do the same? When in ministry or in business or in your home or, or in your life, do you go to God in prayer? Do you take extended periods of time of prayer when making a major decision. Jesus had a prayer life. Number one, Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Number two, Jesus had a prayer life. Number three, Jesus discarded doubt. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 42, we read of the story where Jairus approaches Jesus and he says, Lord Jesus, please come and heal my daughter. And by the time Jesus gets to Jairus' daughter, having been disrupted by the woman with the issue of blood, the daughter had died. And he gets there and he looks and he sees the mourners. They're out there and they're crying and they're saying, oh, she's dead, she's gone. And Jesus, as a declaration of faith, as a declaration of power, as a declaration of his true authority and his power over death in the grave, he says, she is not dead, she's just sleeping. And the people begin to laugh. And in fact, it says that they mocked and laughed him to scorn. They mocked him, they laughed at him. Now, being in the ministry, you will face your critics. You will face those who mock you. You will face those who laugh at you, who scoff at you, who hope that you don't do well. Can I tell you what Jesus did with doubt? The scripture says that he put them out. Everyone who laughed at them and laughed at him, he kicked them out of the house. He said, you get out. Jesus discarded doubt. He didn't try to... Um, let the, he didn't let the intimidation come over him. In fact, I believe that intimidating spirits hang around spirits of doubt. The spirit of intimidation tries to make you feel inferior even though God has given you authority. The spirits of intimidation try to make you feel uneasy and, and silly when you're sharing the gospel. Some people carry that spirit on them and they try to intimidate you. You're the anointed of God. You're the called of God. You have the favor on your life. But those who carry that spirit of intimidation will challenge that on you. And especially when praying for the sick, you'll get your critics. You'll be mocked. Ask our TV director, Tim Lay. He goes through our YouTube comments, and you'd be surprised. Well, I, I don't think you would be surprised at how often criticism comes against me. I don't even read this stuff anymore. Jesus didn't respond to his critics. He just put them out. And when you're in the healing ministry, when you're moving in the supernatural power of God, you'll, you'll get critics, you'll get doubters, you'll get people who will try to intimidate you, you'll get people who will scoff at you, you'll get people who don't like the fact that you have the authority of, the, of God on your life to heal the sick. They don't like the fact that you're anointed and you're favored, and they become jealous. And in their intimidation, that spirit that's on them tries to jump on you. But Jesus was bold. Jesus was audacious. Jesus was full of authority and power. And when those spirits tried to come over, he put them out. He said, all of you leave. And he raised the girl from the dead. Jesus didn't leave them there. He kicked them out. In my services, I've noticed that often I'll come into a service and there'll be a crowd there. And just some crowds are just, they're very uneasy. They're very, you know, they kind of have their arms folded and like, okay, preacher, show me the power of God. You know, and they're not really ready to participate in faith to touch the heart of God, not realizing that that's how you receive from Him. And I don't yell at them. I don't, I don't try to be mean. I don't try to, any of that. What I do is an act of bold faith. Acts of spontaneous boldness and faith do away with spirits of intimidation. They do away with doubt. So in the healing ministry, Jesus, He put out doubt. He removed it from the scene. You don't have to try to reason with the doubters. You don't have to try to explain yourself to the doubters. You don't have to try to debate with the doubters. Just put them out. Put them out of your mind. Put them out of your heart. Put them out of your life. And more importantly, put doubt out of your mind. Put doubt out of your heart. Let doubt be gone from your life. That's what Jesus did. Number one, Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Number two, Jesus had a prayer life. And number three, Jesus discarded doubt. So what's another key to the healing ministry of Jesus? I think this is, this is one of the most powerful keys. So I'm going to read the actual text here. The next key is that Jesus worked with faith. 
not everyone has the same level of faith. Not everyone has the same level of faith as you, and not everyone has the same level of faith as each other. Different people are in different places in their growth with God, and they're maturing, they're growing, they're learning, they're, they're becoming stronger and stronger in Christ every day, hopefully. And so you can't expect everyone to have faith. In fact, for the most part, though the Scripture teaches that it was by someone's faith that they were made whole, I think of people like Lazarus. Who had faith for Lazarus? He was dead. He wasn't even there to have faith, yet Christ had the faith for him. Or that girl, Jairus' daughter, she was dead. Who had faith for her? Her father had faith on her behalf. Or the centurion's servant. Who had faith for the servant but the centurion? And the servant was healed. So though faith has to be present in the moment, some people are at different places in their faith. But here's what the scripture says in Matthew chapter 9. And I love this. And I'll exp I'll, at first it won't make too much sense, but I'm going to tie it in for you. Matthew chapter 9, verse 22, it says this. Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. There we see it's faith that heals. Luke chapter 18, verse 42. It says this in the scripture. Or Luke chapter 18, yeah, I have it here, verse, I believe it's 32. It says again, your faith has made you whole. And then we jump down to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes through the word. Faith comes through hearing. Now, Jesus was the word incarnate. Jesus was the living word. That's partly why everywhere he went, people were healed just instantaneously because he was the word incarnate. He was right before their eyes. You know, that's why people get healed. They get healed because the word comes alive. When I preach at healing services, I mean, often there are times where I, I mean, it's not really possible to lay hands on everybody who's there and wants a healing. But what I can do is minister the word in such a way where it comes alive. And as you're preaching the word, you're building the faith of the people. And right before their eyes, or before the eyes of their heart, they look up and they behold Jesus. As you minister the word, Jesus becomes a reality. The Holy Spirit takes that revelation and he begins, the, begins to cause the Son of God to manifest before their eyes. And when Jesus becomes more real, then their sickness, their heal. I don't take the time always to lay hands on everyone because that's not the most beneficial thing to do. I take the time to get into the Word and preach and build the atmosphere of faith. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Mark chapter 6, verse 5 through 6 says that Jesus couldn't heal some of them because of their unbelief. So faith has to be present for someone to be healed. Um, think about the woman with the issue of blood. A touch did it for her, and that's Luke chapter 8, verse 43 through 44. A word did it for the centurion servant in Luke chapter 7, verse 2 through 10. And in Mark chapter 9, verse 17 through 26, we see a father who brings his son, who's demon-possessed to the disciples. The disciples can't cast the demon out. And the father approaches Jesus and says, Lord, if you can, please help my son. And Jesus says, what do you mean, if I can? Jesus knew his capability. That man just needed a little bit of faith, a little encouragement. Jesus works with faith. The woman with the issue of blood, she needed the touch. The man who was blind and Jesus spit and put mud in his eyes, why did Jesus do that? Well, because that's what the man needed. He was working with the man's faith. I also believe that God does it different each time because if it became too systematic, if it became too rigid, if there was too much of an order to how he performed miracles, then it wouldn't require faith anymore. You would just know that it would take mud and spit and it would cure someone's eyes. You would know that it would touching the, someone's robe would bring healing. He does it differently because the element of faith needs to be present. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But Jesus moved in such a way for each individual in the way that they needed. And when you minister healing, you need to look in the moment and say, okay, Lord, what does this person need right now? What will be their connection of faith? What will be their point of contact that causes them to receive the miracle in their body? The next key, 
Jesus had compassion. Many times we read Luke 17, 11 through 15, we see that a funeral procession goes by and there's a widow whose son had died. It was her only son. And I said, Jesus had great compassion. So he raised her son from the dead. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 34, Mark chapter 1, verse 41, we see that Jesus was moved with compassion. And really, compassion is one of the three reasons God will heal. He moves and heals because of his compassion. He heals because of his covenant. He heals because of the commission. Commission for the sake of the gospel, he'll heal to validate the message. For the covenant, he'll heal because by his stripes we are healed. And for compassion, he'll heal just because he's moved and he loves his people. And so compassion is the key. I want you to get this. Compassion is the key to longevity in the healing ministry. Without compassion, you can grow weary of people's needs. I mean, you have to understand that when the, the grace for healing is on your life, and, and, and I will acknowledge that the grace for healing is on my life, and it can be on yours too. I mean, people know. That's why people come. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not fooled. I ha, I, I'm not delusional. I know that people don't come to my meetings because they want to meet me. They don't come to hear my preaching. People fly in from different continents of the world to be in one service. We've, we have people fly in. They'll, they'll, they'll be on a 14-hour flight. They'll be on an 8-hour flight, a 5-hour flight. They'll land. They'll go to a 2-hour service, turn right back around, and go right back home. Why? It's not because I preach good. It's not because I, 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 they want to meet me. It's because the grace of healing rests on this ministry. It's because when you come to those meetings, the presence of God is tangible in a very unique way. And I, I can say this in all humility because it's God who does it. It has nothing to do with me. And that's what you need to realize is when you have the compassion, you realize it's Him. You know, you sit, if you were to sit down and have lunch with me, you would sit there and you'd notice I'd be drinking water just like you, I'd be eating just like you. There, there might not be this great sense that you of the presence on me all the time. Some people feel it sometimes. And you go, oh, there's nothing really there. And it's true because the element that heals is the Holy Spirit. He's all that is supernatural about me. It's His presence that abides near me. It's all that is divine. And when you get around and sense Him, you want more of Him. And He works in that compassion. Romans 5.5 5 says that the love of God is shed abroad through our hearts by the Holy Spirit. He's constantly working. People should never become crowds to your eyes. In each crowd, you should recognize, acknowledge, and keep at the forefront of your mind at all times the individual needs. I imagine, man, what if when women come before me and ask for healing, especially sometimes there, so, there was a woman who came to me, she looked like my mom and she had cancer. And my heart was so moved. And ever since then I said, Lord, I want to pray for each sick woman as if she was my own mother. Lord, I want to pray for each. I mean, I've seen people who look like my brother, who look like my friend who look like my wife, who look like my nephew. And I move with compassion. I say, Lord, that's the heart you have for everyone. Let me have that. Compassion is the key to longevity in the healing ministry. Because number one, it keeps the people's needs, actual needs, and not just prayer requests. Number two, it keeps you pushing to see greater miracles because when someone's not healed, if you had no compassion, you go, oh, well, they're not healed. I'm going to go on with my life now. But they have to go home to their sickness. And you go on with your life and you never pursue God about it because it doesn't matter. But if it matters to you, if your heart is broken, if you're moved, if it burdens you somewhat, then you can go, Lord, I'm going to seek you until the power so rests on my life that even people with that sickness can be healed. And it drives you to grow in the gift. It drives you to grow in the grace. So when I say this, I'm talking about that grace, and I recognize this grace on my life. And again, it's all glory to God, but I do acknowledge it. Humility is not saying I don't have a gift. Humility is recognizing the source. And I can tell you, I can sense when the grace is there. There's nothing you can do to attain that. Only God can give it. And if you live your life like Jesus did, and there's several more keys here, but for the sake of time, I have to move on um, I know I don't want to keep these two 
you know, too long. But I, I mean, in Luke chapter 18, verse 35 through 42, we see that Jesus responds to a desperate cry of a man. Jesus hears the cry. Do you? Um, number seven, I won't get into. Number seven, or actually, it's sh- this is number eight. Number eight, Jesus set an atmosphere. And maybe I'll teach on that another time. There's another one. Jesus knew God's voice. Jesus pleased the Father. In other words, Jesus was more concerned about what God thought than man thought. Uh, Jesus imparted the healing ministry. There's more and more and more. Um, in fact, if you want the whole teaching, it's available on my book. But I'm going to close on that, Compassion. Compassion in the healing ministry. You may look at other ministries. You may look at my ministry. You may look at my life and say, Lord, I want to be used in that way. Let me tell you, there's a price to pay for it. That grace that rests on someone's life to heal the sick comes from living like Christ lived. And though I haven't obtained, I'm working to obtain. We need to become pursuers of the power of God. And we find that power by touching his heart. And we want to grow in the healing ministry. We want to see greater things. Why? Because there are sick people. So long as sickness is prevalent, the healing ministry is relevant. If Jesus wanted you to be sick, he would not have paid such a high price for your healing. Jesus still heals the sick. And that grace is going to come on your life. So I'm going to pray in a moment. I'm going to pray that this grace that's on my life for the healing of the sick... I pray that it would be imparted to you as you do these things. Remember, I can pray this and it'll be imparted. But if you do nothing with that impartation, it's never going to grow. I want to plant the seed of impartation. And you're going to grow it. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, ask the Lord to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. If you don't have a prayer life, get back on your face before God and begin to pray. Begin to cast out doubt. Begin to work with the faith that people have. Work with them where they are, where they're at. And have compassion. God wants to use you in this area. I, I want to really drive this point home because you look at people in the healing ministry, and again, if you were to sit down with one-on-one for a whole day, when I'm, not, I'm not talking after service when the anointing's still resting on them. I'm talking you just go to their house, relax with them for a day, you, would, you might lose that awe, which is good. And you would notice that they're just like you. And I say that not to sound uh, condescending or to make it seem like, you know, there's uh, nothing like that. But I want, I'm, I'm saying that so you can realize that God can use you in the same way. God can use you in the same way, but there's a price to pay. You have to walk according to it. You have to grow. He wants to touch your life. So let's pray that God will begin to use you to heal the sick. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray right now for that one watching who wants to be used in miracles and healing. They want to be used like Jesus was used. Lord Jesus, we look to you. We look to you as the great healer. And Father, I pray that there would be an impartation of the healing anointing. Let them receive according to their faith, Father. As much faith as they have, let them receive according to the capacity of their faith. Help us to walk like you. Help us to acknowledge that you alone are the source of this grace. Lord, let us recognize the weightiness of the matter that we carry the continuation of the healing ministry that you walked in. Lord, we are continuing your healing ministry. I want you to put your hands out like this, like you're receiving something. Lord, place a mantle over their hands. Let the healing power of God begin to flow. Lord, let such that grace that's been imparted onto my life, Lord, let it flow and touch a generation in the same way. Let them not hold back. Let them realize, Father, that as children of God, they can walk in this grace. We thank you for it. There's someone watching me right now, and you 
felt called to the healing ministry, and this is confirmation for you. And you're wondering, God, what do I do next? Here's what you do. You go out and you start praying for the sick. And just like anything, you're going to grow in it. At first, you'll see small miracles, and you keep going. You praise God for the little miracles as if they're the big ones, and you appreciate it, and you walk in it, and you stay faithful, and you're going to see some awesome things. Well, that's it for the lesson. That's it for the prayer. As always, remember, you can support this ministry. We need, like, I need your help. We're moving into some great things. Big doors are opening. We want to expand the outreach. I'm talking to you, you, the viewer. I'm not talking to someone else watching on YouTube, someone else watching on television. I'm talking to you. God has so put it on your heart. If he has so put it on your heart, so into this ministry. Some of you could do 100. Some of you could do 10. Some of you could do 50. Some of you could do 1,000. Go online. Do it now. Also, if you want the full teaching on how Jesus healed the sick, there's a book that I've written on it, and the link will be in the description of this video. If you're watching on the app, uh, you won't be able to get to that link, I think, in the description, but you can click on the section that says more in the app. You scroll down to the store, and you'll see the book, How Jesus Healed the Sick, right there. Well, that's it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible.